Um, so just to kick things off, I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming out today, uh, or well, I guess staying on your computer again today uh, for another hour. And uh, appreciate you stopping by Venture Cafe St. Louis. You know, obviously we're still online um, and we'll be for, you know, probably the foreseeable future until things change a little bit here. Uh, but this year we're doing something a little new where we've invited um, different uh, leaders and experts from the St. Louis uh, ecosystem here and the startup ecosystem. And uh, wanted to make sure that we get to hear a little bit more from the experts out there from, you know, people like T-Rex and their team and their startups. Uh, and, and other organizations that are helping, you know, support entrepreneurs. So we're really excited to have um, uh, Patty Hagen, who's the executive director of T-Rex, join us today, who's going to kick off uh, a discussion with Brian Matthews, the uh, founding partner of Cultivation Capital. We, uh, this is the first of a series with T-Rex, uh, where Patty uh, is graciously hosting uh, several, uh, you know, experts and entrepreneurs from the community to chat about how they built it. And so you get a, a behind-the-scenes peek at how the, uh, the startups and companies um, had, you know, gotten, you know, became overnight successes over several years. Um, and uh, today we're excited to have Brian with us. So I'm going to kick it off to Patty to, uh, to, can, to just get us started. So thanks again, Patty. Appreciate it. Well, Tyler, thanks for inviting us to participate. And it's, it's really exciting to uh, be involved in this. Um, this is um, an effort uh, and it's a little personal on my part because I'm so interested in the stories of entrepreneurship and, and then the stories of entrepreneurs. And um, I'm lucky to have enticed one of my favorite entrepreneur friends <laughs> to join us today, Brian Matthews, who um, has a long career um, as an entrepreneur and um, is now, as, as Tyler mentioned, um, one of the founding principles of Cultivation Capital, um, which um, has been, and has been a great supporter of our efforts here at T-Rex for a long time as well. So, and the entire ecosystem, Brian has been involved in the St. Louis ecosystem and building the St. Louis entrepreneurial ecosystem for many years and um, has, has also been a mentor to me as well. So it's a, it's a real honor and um, a privilege to have Brian join us today. So thank you, Brian, for joining us. Thank you for <laughs> of course, of course. So, um, you know, this is, the, this is our um, first uh, little set, our first um, uh, issue in this set of uh, entrepreneurial uh, conversations. And um, the stories of our entrepreneurs really start with kind of um, how you got started and, and where you come from and, and, and sort of how that entrepreneurial spirit grew in you. So we'll just, we just want to kind of have a little conversation about, um, about uh, your past and, and, and what led you to um, uh, starting businesses, several businesses, actually. So Brian, are you originally from St. Louis? Yes, I am. I um, grew up in uh, Brentwood, Missouri. I uh, went to Brentwood High School, in case anyone's um, wondering, and uh, ultimately went to college at uh, Missouri Science and Technology. I know it is Rolla. And um, so that's about as far away from St. Louis as I've ever um, been residing. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much a lifer in St. Louis. Yeah, true blue St. Louis, for sure. Um, and Brian, Mo S and T was a, a big uh, uh, had a big impact on you, right? I mean that uh, you you went to the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Is that what it was called? Or well, actually, no. I was mechanical engineer uh, okay. by degree, and um, yeah. So you know, uh, Raul is a great uh, great university. I, I, I like to call it a corporate university. Uh, most of their professors have come out of the corporate world and uh, everybody's kind of uh, schooled into getting into the cooperative programs of one of the large corporations and, and start their careers there. Now they're trying to change that with, uh, you know, what, what's going on in the entrepreneurial world now. But uh, they really, when I was there, I had never heard of the word entrepreneur. Um, you know, it was many years into McDonnell Douglas before I ever knew I was an entrepreneur, to be honest. Um, and, and um, so anyway, when, when I left there, I, um, I went to McDonnell Douglas, uh, now called Boeing, uh, 
but uh, it was McDonnell Douglas when I went there, went there in 81, and they immediately put me into the computer-aided technology area, and I worked on uh, computers from day one. Uh, just as today, back then, there wasn't enough comp size. And so uh, they, they took engineers and uh, made them comp size. And, and so, yeah, from day one, I, I was uh, working on programs uh, in the engineering space at, uh, at McDonnell Douglas. And, um, you know, I loved my time there. I, I, I spent a lot of time there. I was there for 11 years, actually, and um, le learned a lot. I think uh, leaving college and going straight into the corporate world in a big nation really has its advantages. Um, you know, I like to say a lot of times you don't know what you can disrupt because you don't know enough, right? In college, you know, pizza and intramural sports and library. And so, you know, how do you disrupt those? Or you can, but, you know, we all can't. And so, um, you know, I joined the corporate world and, uh, and worked there for many years. And, and, you know, one of the underlying principles that I got was, um, was ARPANET. And, um, you know, learning and networking uh, pre-internet and, and uh, really made a difference in, in my, my career over time was, uh, was that underpinnings of that. Uh, but I quickly ended up in advanced design. And I think if you're an engineer at Boeing or McDonnell Douglas, advanced design is where entrepreneurs end up going. Um, you're, you've got a little bit more flexibility. You get to... Uh, uh, touch a lot of different aspects of uh, the designs that you're working on. And, and so, um, you know, I, I spent a number of years in advanced design and, uh, and, and learned a lot of various in, in industries or disciplines uh, at that point in time. Uh, but during that time, I, uh, I was playing this stupid statistical game called fantasy sports. And, uh, it wasn't called fantasy sports at that time. I knew it as rotisserie baseball and, um, and, and spent a lot of my free time uh, in, in that area and um, got to connect with people across ARPANET at other aerospace companies and, and created a um, aerospace uh, rotisserie baseball league uh, in the uh, mid to late 80s that got pretty serious and uh, became the statistician and used... Uh, uh, digital vaxes to uh, calculate the statistics. So I was using corporate assets to keep track of the teams. And, uh, and then ultimately um, got a Macintosh. Back then it was really the entry point was, uh, was, was difficult. I mean, there was early PCs and I, I ended up uh, with a Macintosh and uh, met my wife there. And, uh, and the two of us started working on developing software to manage uh, rotisserie league baseball. Uh, and that, that was really the start of my entrepreneurial career doing that after hours. And over time, um, uh, you know, got serious about it, put together a business plan and we went and we won a contract with the Sporting News to do fantasy sports back in 1991. Uh, and uh, Carol, my wife left first. And then uh, about five or six months later, one of my other, other co-founders, John Bryson and I uh, left. And uh, company was hugely successful out of the gates. We were one of the first fantasy sports companies. So we had an early mover advantage. We did almost $5 million the first year, uh, was profitable and, and we were off to the races. And within two years, we were the largest fantasy sports operator in the United States operating it under the sporting news name. Wow. And uh, yeah, became very good friends uh, with the people at the sporting news. And um, they asked us to um, to get them online. And so we started creating the Sporting News Online, which was similar to AOL at that time. This was, again, right before the internet. And during the process of developing all of that, the internet came along and we quickly switched to uh, uh, creating a presence for both uh, our fantasy sports company and the Sporting News Online. And that's what then really led me into uh, starting both primary network and uh, primary web works. Uh, one was an ISP that put corporations and people on the internet and, and primary web works uh, created websites and, and put corporations on the web uh, with their businesses. So we provided both connectivity and uh, developing websites. And uh, 
that business took off as well. We financed that in the in the early years through profits of the fantasy sports company. Um, so anyway, my my first foray into venture capital was with Primary Network, and uh, it, we we started the process in 1998. I was actually spending time with Jim Cavanaugh, who was at Worldwide Technology at that time, and there wasn't. Uh, too many people around town that we could go to uh, to learn about uh, venture capital. And so Kavanaugh and I would, would get together. And ultimately in 1999, we went out and we raised uh, uh, $50 million and uh, raised it from one of George Soros's firms called Everest Capital down in Miami. And uh, so that was really my first and only taste as an entrepreneur of raising venture capital money. Um, uh, Soros's firm, uh, Dimitri was running it, uh, did not want uh, the web development side of the house. So we spun that out. It became a company called Verticon and we hired uh, some co-founders uh, to run that. Um, uh, both, uh, well, uh, the, the, the main, uh, Charles Windsor was the CEO and Charles brought on uh, Jeffrey Davis. Uh, Jeff Jeffrey Davis is now, um, we, we ultimately sold that business to um, Proficient and Jeffrey Davis is CEO of Proficient to this day. And uh, Proficient's now worth about $1.6 billion. And Jeffrey Davis, who was COO of that company at the time is just an amazing um, CEO and uh, couldn't be more happy for him and, and the team. Um, so, um, it, I, I continued to run Primary Network, and uh, we ultimately sold that right before the dot-com bust for about $250 million. And uh, that was uh, all this time. We still had the uh, fantasy sports company, and my wife, Carol, and two of my other co-founders were running that. And then uh, we started uh, one more company of note, and that was uh, Intra-ISP. Uh, Intra ISP was back off of software for ISPs, and we had CompuServe and a company called uh, Clearwire Communications, which was Craig McCall's company out of Seattle. Uh, he ultimately sold that to Sprint. And uh, all four of these companies we were able to sell, and we sold them to publicly traded companies. So started uh, four companies from 1991 to 2001, and uh, had them all sold uh, by 2007. Uh, Fantasy Sports Company sold to Liberty Media in uh, 2006, and Intri SP ultimately sold to Clearwire and then Amdocs in 2007. So that's kind of uh, a long-winded answer to my 15 years as a entrepreneur. Well, so Brian, um, g going back to that first moment when you when you uh, and Carol were at McDonnell Douglas and, and you were thinking, okay, this this thing is really taking off. What was what was the moment, or, or maybe it's hard to identify the moment that you said, you know what, we're doing this thing. We are gonna. Was it scary? Was it? How did it feel to move from? having that sort of security in a big corporation to um, doing your own thing. Was that ever a worry for you or did you always know that it would work? Oh, uh, no, we never knew it would work. Uh, uh, there, there was a couple of points. One was very interesting because uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, Boeing or McDonnell Douglas wasn't doing that well. And so everyone was trying to come up with an idea to get the heck out of town. And yeah. uh, everyone thought my idea was stupid, was crazy, right? And no one thought, I mean, you know, fantasy sports wasn't a thing yet. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think in one side, that's good that no one else is thinking about it, but it also gives you a lot of pause when everybody who you respect is telling you it's a stupid idea. Um, so there was a lot of hesitation because of that. Um, I think the aha moment was when we presented to the sporting news and that afternoon they called us and said we had a deal. And, um, you know, locking in someone at that time, the sporting news was a big deal back in those days. This was pre-internet and print made a uh, you know, a big impact on everyone's life. And they were a, a weekly sports publication. Uh, 
And so uh, I think that was the moment. Now, we had so much to do after they said yes. I mean, we had a little company. We ran this company for a year and a half out of our house. And now we needed, we knew we needed lots of employees to make this happen. And so uh, we worked our tails off for really for a couple of years. Um, I don't think we took a real vacation for like three years. It was seven days a week. The bad thing about sports is it's almost every single day and it's busiest on the weekends. And so uh, you never had any time off. Um, but yeah, I think the sporting news deal is what, um, is when we knew we were on to something big. Okay. So and did you have, um, did you have any trouble attracting employees to help you get going or, or to, you know, move forward or, or, or how was the, t- how was getting talent at that time? Uh, I think so, um, Primary network ended up with 600 employees, and I think we peaked at around 150 employees at uh, CDM Fantasy Sports. And uh, I think at one time we had 150 former McDonnell Douglas employees working for us. And so that's where we got our talent, right? Um, It's who we knew. I had worked there for many years, and I knew what their capabilities were. So we took a lot of people from there. Yeah. So I don't think talent was ever the issue. Um, it, it really, it really was. I mean, we were hiring a lot of people. I think after we raised the money from uh, Everest Capital, uh, we hired maybe a hundred people that year, or maybe 150. Um, and so, but a lot of people below me were doing the hiring, so I might not have um, recognized as difficult as it was. But in the early years, uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't too hard. Yeah. Okay. It, in in terms of fundraising for the business at that time, you know, it really wasn't something. And I could be I, I could be stating this incorrectly, so correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. But at that time, it really wasn't a, a thing that was as well understood as it is now. Um, how to build a tech company and how tech companies get built. How did you know, or how, how did you connect with? how you would even begin to fund, you know, your startup. Yeah, I, uh, so I, networked, I networked with uh, people around town who had raised money for other uh, industries, not tech industries, and ultimately got set up with an investment banking firm uh, called Libra out of uh, New York City. And... Um, we went with an investment banker uh, out of the gate and uh, because we really didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have the context. There was no internet to go figure out who the people with money were. Uh, investment banking was much more uh, important, I think, at that time. Today, you know, with LinkedIn and the internet, you can go and connect directly to the venture firms. But um, back in the, in the 90s, that, that just wasn't a, a thing. You had to go through an investment banker who had the relationships. So uh, ultimately connected to an investment banking firm out of New York City, and they're the ones that took us on the journey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did, um, was it, uh, it must be a different kind of an argument, not an argument, but a different kind of a pitch now than, back then in terms of a tech company, right? It, was it, were you educating people um, from sort of a, a really, you know, point zero to, you know, what this thing could be? Yeah, I, that, that's true. I mean, the internet was still pretty young. And so there, there was a lot of uh, the VCs that we pitched that uh, didn't completely understand it. But um, when we were out there, the East Coast and the West Coast was somewhat mature with the internet. And so we were really trying to do a land grab in the Midwest. So um, our ISP was in five states at that point in time, and uh, there wasn't much competition. And so, you know, the VCs kind of got that opportunity, right? We've been flyover country with VCs forever. And and so, um, you know, they saw us as um, you know, Earthlink of the Midwest, let's say. Earthlink was a big player back then. And, and so 
Um, you know, I think that's a pitch today that a lot of startups still use in the Midwest is we're kind of like this company on the West Coast and, you know, we've got these opportunities that are being overlooked because we're right. in the Midwest. Right. Well, you know, that what you just said, that's a good entree to, um, you know, after you had such great success as an entrepreneur, um, you decided to um, start to help entrepreneurial companies and invest in entrepreneurial companies yourself. So what, what brought you to that point? So I was an angel, an angel investor since probably 1998 and had done a lot of different types of investing and um, had one big success. And, and that was with a company called Paylinks that was started by Bob Lozano, which is Gabe Lozano's father. Um, and, and we were one of his first uh, checks and we were one of his first big customers. Um, uh, CD and Fantasy Sports was at that time probably processing 10 or $12 million over the internet with credit cards and Paylinks was an internet credit card mm. processor. And, and so uh, it was a really good fit. It was serendipitous. But um, that was like my first outside investment. Um, but we, we did a number of them as, as uh, founders of, of CDM over the decade before, uh, probably up into 2008. And so I, I'd, I'd been doing angel investing. And I think I did 42 is the number that I um, ended up with. And um, um, was interested in helping St. Louis um, because it was so hard for us and so hard for many of the uh, companies that I had invested in that it had been in the back of my head since probably 2005 that we needed access to capital here in St. Louis. And so um, got involved with Capital Innovators uh, when T-Rex first opened and, and it was Capital Innovators that brought me to T-Rex back in 2011. I was a mentor, an investor, and uh, you know, uh, Judy and Hal were investing fifty thousand dollar checks, and uh, it was obvious that fifty thousand is nice and it's a good way to get started. But we needed much more capital than that, and that's that's really when the idea, I would say, in twenty eleven, of, of cultivation capital um, came about, and um, we started cultivation capital in uh, April, April fifteenth, actually, of twenty twelve. And, um, um, you know, the original goal was to raise $10 million and focus on St. Louis. And, um, you know, it was going to be a tech fund. And now we've got tech fund and life science fund and a pandemic fund and an ag tech fund and uh, uh, going to be announcing a geospatial fund and uh, $250 million under management. And uh, still 40% of our deals are in St. Louis. Uh, but, you know, we're, we got a company in Australia, we got Israeli based companies, we, I, I sit on a board in Buenos Aires, uh, it's really gotten bigger than um, any of us ever thought. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, Brian, the success you guys have had. Um, cultivation is so well known, especially um, throughout the Midwest and is getting such recognition nationally. You guys are awesome. You bring so much to St. Louis. Um, and we're really grateful, you know, within the ecosystem for everything that you guys are doing. Um, what are what are some of the companies that you're most excited about right now that um, that cultivation is involved with? I know there's a lot, so yeah, and, and you, it's like your children, right? How do you pick your favorite children? <laughs> yeah, you never want to that you think, yeah. Yeah, I never want to admit. Uh, omit any, um, you know, uh, Balto's doing amazing things. Um, Locker Dome is absolutely crushing it. Um, obviously, Benson Hill, um, it's a company called Genioscopy that's doing very well in the Life Science Fund that everyone in, in our firm's really excited about. Um, let's see, we've got Clever, uh, Noonlight are, are all doing good things. Um, I, we just had a couple of very nice exits avail out of Chicago, obviously gain site just, just sold. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got, uh, we're identifying maybe up to five exits this year of, of significance. Wow. So 
it's it's a big year and it's time, right? I mean, we started in 2012 and and funds, uh, you know, most companies that we invest in should exit in in that five to eight year period. And so it, it's it's really time for us to start, um, you know, putting some money back in the pockets of our investors. And, you know, uh, Cultivation is made up of 17 partners and uh, 10 back office personnel and 450 limited partners. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a big tent. It's a big tent that that, that makes this happen. You know, um, I, I might have been the founder, but just like in all of the companies that I started, it's it's my co-founders and it's the employees that uh, have have made Cultivation Capital what it is. There's uh, so many uh, people to thank, and and then certainly our investors, uh, the people that took the early risk on us in in 2012, and then some of the larger investors, and still to this day, uh, 90 plus percent of the money comes from St. Louis, and uh, mm -hmm. most of them are high net worth individuals. They're not um, they're not institutions, and, uh, mm -hmm. and and we're proud of that. And it really was a mission to try to indoctrinate high net worth individuals that um, you can make a difference uh, through investing uh, back into the, your community. And, and, and that was uh, a message from the very beginning. And, and I think we're all uh, starting to see the fruits of that. Um, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's a 10 to 20 year process to, to change this stuff. And you know, we're probably in year 10 on the tech side and we're close to year 20 on the biotech side. And so, mm -hmm. Uh, I was telling uh, Dave Nicholas the other day that uh, this decade is really going to be the decade of startups in, in St. Louis. There's no doubt in my mind that there's big things coming. Um, you can just tell by the amount of capital. Last year, it was 400 million was invested in St. Louis, and and you know these are outside investors uh, that have so many options of where they can put their money in, and and they've decided to put it in companies in St. Louis, and. And, and that's a early indicator of what's to come, right? That money comes in and it creates lots of jobs. And at some point in time, it returns a lot of money to the founders of these companies, as well as the investors of these companies. That, and it all gets redeployed um, with the Quality yeah. Small Business Act and, and the savings that you can get uh, from investing in these early stage companies that, 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 flywheel just really starts happening. And when you see uh, cities like Indianapolis and Chicago who uh, have had some billion dollar exits and, and how that uh, really starts to change uh, the mentality within a city. Um, St. Louis is really at that point. I expect big things this next decade. So Brian, um, I agree. I mean, we we see it, and I think there's a lot of interest from um, investors on both coasts now looking at the Midwest. You mentioned something earlier about the Midwest um, sort of being overlooked, right, for for many years, and we, we see it here. And and you're describing that. How, how, what are investors um, from um, elsewhere in the country um, looking for in St. Louis? What, what are they starting to notice here that they hadn't noticed before? Well, the first thing is, uh, since we started in 2012, the VCs don't expect you to move to the Bay Area. And, and, and that's the biggest difference. And, and the most important difference for economic development within, within cities like St. Louis and Indianapolis and Kansas City. Um, and, and so, um, you know, what they see here is quality of life um, and, and certain expertise that is not necessarily common on the coast, right? Um, you know, and it, it usually centers around the corporations and the universities' expertise that you have. And, and so each city uh, has the special uh, expertise or uh, talent uh, within a city. And, and so the companies that um, get formed tend to resonate or build around those uh, experiences, right? And so um, obviously biotech, ag tech is huge. Uh, geospatial is nascent, but, um, you know, we've got just some incredible assets here. And uh, uh, I was, I, I, I took some presentations today from a couple of companies, one out of DC, 
and they said it, it, it's unbelievable how St. Louis is already on the map. I mean, um, you know, that the fact that the chamber is at GO Int and, and, they, and everybody is noticing that. They go, why is the St. Louis chamber, now, now greater St. Louis, uh, at this event? And, and, and it's really resonating. And now St. Louis is already, in such a short amount of time, started getting a reputation on um, geospatial. So really excited uh, about that. But, um, you know, we, we've always been strong in ag. We've really been a great uh, infrastructure and, and technology uh, company here, uh, corporate company here. And so um, all of those things uh, continue to do well. We're a great banking hub. So there's lots of fintech opportunities. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, a lot more here than in many markets. A lot of markets are just known for one thing. And we truly have three, four, five different um, industry sectors that uh, uh, the VCs are, are coming and exploring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, um, in terms of geospatial, the presence of the NGA, um, the resources, honestly, to be a little self-serving, the things, the resources we built at T-Rex, um, NGA is going to build Moonshot Labs at T-Rex, we're, we're constructing that now. I mean, I, I think all those things add up together to, to a real um, opportunity for, for our ecosystem and for the region uh, to leverage. So um, we're really excited about that. Um, Brian, we have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs um, who are with us in this little session today and um, are people who are interested in entrepreneurship and so I want to ask a little bit of advice from you for um, our people who are interested in, in starting their own business or at the earliest stages of that. What are what would you say are, are, are some of the things that people need to think about at that early stage? And, and what are a couple of the biggest mistakes that people sometimes make in, in uh, starting their entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is a hard one, but this is this is one of the things I think have made uh, my career so successful, and that is you need to have multiple co-founders. It's really hard scaling a business. It's it's really hard, and trying to do it by yourself is is it's very rare that a company is successful with a single founder, and and so. Uh, giving up your idea and sharing your idea and and bringing in a co-founder too that fills the gaps that you have uh, in your career is is just so important. And it, <coughs> excuse me, the earliest you earlier you can do that, uh, the the more traction you're going to get uh, sooner. So yeah, yeah. and what, what are some of the thing. biggest um, yeah biggest mistakes maybe that people make? Well, um, you know, a lot of times the founders are really technical and uh, they, they build a great product, but uh, they don't like talking to people. They don't like selling it. They don't like supporting it. And, and so finding people that you can put around you and, and, and early co-founders that are, are focused on operations, that are focused on sales, uh, I think is is really important and getting the product out in front of people sooner rather than later and getting that feedback. Um, waiting too long mm -hmm. to uh, share it with uh, with potential customers, I think is is a, a, a big mistake because you never completely figure out exactly what this application should do. And again, I'm talking from a software perspective, which is my background, not from biotech or uh, maybe an ag tech perspective, but uh, uh, co-founders across the board, what, no matter what industry you're in, is just so important. If you're a technical person, getting a people person, if you're a salesperson, getting a technical person in with you is, as early as possible is, is one of the most important things you can do. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's this, this idea of recognizing where you're strong and where you need and where you're not as strong and how you can fill those gaps, right? Yeah, and, and you know, sharing your company is hard too. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 50% uh, of something is better than 100% of nothing. 
And, uh, yeah. you know, it's it's best to, to do that early. You're going to move so much faster with that other person and, and selling them on your idea and working together is, is more fulfilling on a daily basis because being an entrepreneur is lonely. And, and so getting a co-founder or two, and I, I think in all of my uh, companies that I started, we had three or four co-founders in, in every one. And um, it, it just allows you to scale so much faster. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so uh, my friend Tyler tells me that we should go to about 345. So we're not too far from that. And I wanted to give um, folks in, in the session here a, a chance to uh, send in any questions they have or we can unmute you as well. It's our first time doing this. So again, whatever works best for you. Are there any questions out there that we haven't covered yet? Hi, Brian, this is Megan. I was a student at Cliffs uh, about five years ago or so. Um, and I'm curious, I understand all of the, every VC has their own thesis for the future and some of that can be, you know, held close to the vest, but are there any predictions or unique insights you have um, that you're willing to share over the, as you guys look at current companies now and companies growing um, over the next, you know, five to 10 years, like where do you see the next decade kind of proliferating for, for young founders like all of us? Oh, wow. There's, there's so many areas. Um, uh, there, uh, space is a huge one. Autonomous vehicles is big. Uh, you know, somewhat maybe boring uh, areas or areas that have been out of favor that's really hot is ad tech. Ad, advertising technology is big again because um, you know, cookies are going away and, and with all the privacy policies, how you uh, match um, advertising with people who are somewhat anonymous on the other side, that kind of uh, technology is just going to be huge over the next decade. And it's a massive market, you know, advertising's trillions and trillions of dollars. And so um, ad tech's a, a big space that I think has been out of favor for five years. Um, um, I mean, everything is getting disrupted. I mean, we see so many good ideas and more today than ever before. I was talking to Cliff uh, earlier today and, oh my gosh, we, we, we are just seeing so many companies with a million and two million in revenue and growing at the, the rates we like of 10 to 20% month over month in things from ed tech to not-for-profit tech to... Uh, space tech. I mean, it's just uh, just just amazing, and it's um, it's not slowing down. It's it's going faster, and, and and it's a great time to be raising money. There's so much money uh, floating around for so many of the obvious reasons: uh, the stimulus, the Fed. Um, you know, so there's a a, a lot of money being uh, invested in these ideas. So it's a great time to be an entrepreneur and, and taking the leap. Thank you, question, Megan. Anybody else out there? Okay, everybody's just taking it all in, Brian. Okay, Brian, kind of a personal question, but hope you don't mind. What What are some of the uh, first things you're going to do after the stupid pandemic is over? <laughs> I'm looking forward to a Cardinal baseball game. I'm looking forward to going to Napa and doing some wine tasting uh, and and just going on vacation, uh, you know, just getting out of the house. Uh, did uh, drive Carol's mom down to Miami. And so I did that the first week of January. That was the first time out of the house in nine months. But uh, oh, those wow. are the things I like to do. Drinking wine, uh, going and seeing the sights, and uh, going to Cardinal Baseball. Those, those are my loves. Yeah, those all sound good to me, too. What are what are some things that you've learned during this pandemic? Or what what is a, I, I know I've gotten a little value out of um, some of the things that we've gone through, um, you know, here at T-Rex and even personally. But what are things that have been sort of beneficial, do you think? Well, our portfolio has done amazing um, during this time period, and uh, we're all more efficient. 
right? There's, there's less small talk. That can be bad, but uh, we're more efficient on Zoom calls and we can get more Zoom calls in and, um, and we're not paying for travel and we're not paying for breakfasts and lunches at, at, at our portfolio companies. And so um, it, it's really been good from a growth perspective in most of our portfolio companies. Now we have a hundred and so there's some that are in bad industries, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, if you're in the hospitality business, it wasn't a good year. We, we, one of our better companies is a company called Cloudbeds that does back office for hotels. And they clawed their way from 35% down in May to being 3% up for the year. Um, mm. and, and we all sell it, right? So uh, we usually like to see 100% growth rate. But uh, getting back to uh, where you were at at the beginning of the year for somebody in the hotel business is a win. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I would say 90% of our uh, portfolio uh, did very well and it's because we were all more efficient. Yeah, I agree. I, I also think that there's a, there's a value to Zoom, although we all get tired of Zoom, but I think there's a value to um, participating in Zoom. We have a lot of interesting people who join meetings that we have um, even nationally, that would not have been able to participate with us had it not been on Zoom. So um, that's been a, a cool thing. I, I think that personally, I think we're going to have sort of a hybrid of what we've experienced moving forward. We've we've learned a lot in that way. Yeah, I think that's yeah, right. That's I've, right. I've uh, attended more conferences uh, in the last year virtually than I definitely ever would have going um, and flying to a city to go to that conference. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I like the fact that I can just listen to certain things and then turn it off and do something else. So uh, yeah, Zoom has made us more efficient there. Um, and uh, you're right. I, I don't think we know what the world looks like from a um, workforce perspective uh, once this is all done. But I, I, I think it's going to be a combination of work from home and working in the office a certain amount of days of the week. I saw Microsoft just launched a product called Viva that's focused on employee engagement and how to keep everybody feeling like they're part of it. Because I'm worried about culture over time, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when we're all working together, we have a certain culture within our company. And how do you keep that culture? And I was listening to a Microsoft CEO and, and they have developed the product. They have 196,000 employees and he's worried about that. And so yeah. they've developed a product called Viva that is focused on employee engagement and, and trying to keep everybody feeling like a part of, of the company. And so th those are going to be some of the challenges working from home. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Brian, we have one more question. And then um, I think we're, we're about out of time. But um, one of our uh, attendees is, is wondering about how they can get more information on the geospatial uh, fund that you guys have started, or, or is there is is there information out there about that? Yeah, we haven't really rolled anything out, but if you send an email to Paul Meyer at Cultivation Capital, it's P M E I E R at CultivationCapital.com. Paul is the principal on the fund and is the traffic cop for any kind of deals that may come in. So, um, and, and, you know, or you can just go to info at cultivationcapital.com and, and, uh, and send an email there and it'll get to the appropriate person. And that's true of any company we've got. And if you're early stage, our Spirit of St. Louis Fund is perfect. Uh, we write $250,000 checks. Uh, we've got like 25 companies within the portfolio, mostly from St. Louis. And uh, uh, we'd love to see your business plan. We'd love to uh, engage with you. So anybody out there with an early stage idea might be a little too early for, for us, but um, you know, we'll, we'll send you off in the right direction if it is. Yeah, and, and a shout out also about Arch Grants. Um, they started a, a geospatial fund. They're earlier stage than Brian's funds, but um, they're doing a, a geospatial fund too. I think they just... Um, well, they just made awards, but I, I think they're going to run another um, cycle uh, at some point. I don't have the dates, but I would check with Arch Grants as well. And then I lied. There is one more question. Um, one of our attendees is wondering about how um, a person might get involved with working in a VC fund. Um, so 
you know, getting involved and in being a part of a venture capital um, fund, Be, maybe not being an investor, but working um, there. So, yeah, yeah that, that's a hard. There's, uh, uh, it's it's a pretty competitive space as far as getting a job. Uh, mo most of the people are that that get into it are either successful entrepreneurs or uh, come through one of the university programs on entrepreneurialism or MBA. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's typically where they start with, is with an MBA and start as a principal within our fund and, and work their way up. Uh, two of our principals have become partners, uh, both Elise uh, Miller Hoffman uh, is a partner on our pandemic fund. She started as a WashU MBA and started um, interning with us. And then uh, Kyle Wellborn is a partner on our ag tech fund. And Kyle was actually a co-founder with us, but was our first principal and is now a partner. Um, so you can start on the ground floor, usually with a business degree. Uh, or the easiest way is to be a successful entrepreneur. Uh, so. Okay. Well, thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us.